Do you know that there is only one God in three eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you know that Jesus said he is the only way to heaven, and his death and resurrection bring forgiveness of sins to all who believe? Welcome to the Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study God's Word, the Bible, together. Welcome to the Pastor Study. When I was 13 years old, I played trumpet. My little brother played trombone, and he quit. Dad was not happy. <laughs> and I remember at that point, I got one of the few compliments that I got growing up. Dad said, Tommy, the good thing about you is that you never quit. You always follow through. Well, I didn't know that about me, but Dad said it, so it must be true. So I finished high school. I finished college, I finished seminary, and I've been a pastor now for 43 years. And my point is, when your father, and I'm talking God now, when your heavenly father says something about you, it's true. And the more you believe that, the more your life will be transformed. I, I, I know someone who told me the name his father used to call him when he was a little boy. I can't say it on the air. Some of you were abused and uh, hurt by lies that your mom or your dad or, or your little kids at school, we get lied to by the devil. The way we're going to be transformed is if we stop listening to the lie and start listening to what God says we are. And we have a wonderful passage of scripture, Colossians chapter 1, which today will tell us three things that your father says you are. You are rescued, you are reassigned, and you are redeemed. So would you take out a Bible, turn in the New Testament to Colossians chapter 1, and let's take our stand and believe who God says we are to set us free from the lies of the devil that we maybe grew up with. Let's pray first. Lord, we do pray, people that have been abused in life or lied to in life, and now they're fighting the lies, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and tell us who we really are and that you would speak to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Colossians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is writing this to the Christians at Colossae, which is modern-day Turkey. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 13. The Apostle Paul writes, For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness. I want us to camp on the word he. Here's what I want you to get for our first point. He means he has to do the rescuing. I can't do that. You know, I don't believe in positive thinking. That if you believe something hard enough, it's got to happen. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I mean, I can believe real hard that I'm going to go to Mars and back. That's crazy. I don't believe in positive thinking. Uh, he, he means God has to do the rescuing. I saw a Presbyterian church that had a sign in front, believe in yourself. Ugh, I don't want to believe in myself. I want to believe in him. He's the one that moves mountains. Um, you know, yes, atheists can build the Empire State Building. They can do that. But rescuing someone from sin that takes Jesus Christ. The word he in, in that verse, I'm a Lutheran. It's Lutheranism in a nutshell, me, mainly teaching, I'm saved by God's grace, not by what I do, because I can't do it. <laughs> the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous, we recognize that we are powerless over our addiction. We need a higher power. That's what the word he means. He has to do the rescuing. Next word, he has, First uh, Colossians 1.13, he has rescued us. The first thing your father says about you is you are rescued. What does it mean to be rescued? There's a story that many years ago a luxury cruise liner was sailing the Mediterranean. A man's dog falls overboard. The owner runs up to the captain, stop, my dog's fallen, we're on, my dog's fallen overboard. And the captain says, sir, the king of Greece is sailing with us today. We do not stop this ship for a dog. Well, but if it was a man overboard, you'd stop it, wouldn't you? And the 
captain said, well, yes, of course we would. With that, the man jumps overboard, rescues his dog. They had to stop the ship, and they saved them both. <laughs> when the New Testament says you are rescued, here's what it means. I was drowning in my sin. I was about to go down for the last time. God jumps down from heaven, lands in a manger in Bethlehem, becomes a human being, lives the perfect life we couldn't, goes to the cross to pay for our sins, to pull us out of our sin, and to bring us safely on God's ship. That's what rescued means. He has rescued, next word, us. Now, I want you to notice, it doesn't say he rescues everybody. It says he rescues us. Here's the next lesson. He only rescues believers. I mean, if you are trusting in Christ for your salvation, you're rescued. If you're rejecting Christ, you're going to go under. Looks, and look what he rescued us from. He has rescued us from the dominion. That means the authority and power of darkness. He has rescued us from the authority and the power of darkness. Let's talk about darkness for a minute. Like I said, I have a younger brother. He was not scared of the dark. Even though I was the older brother, I was petrified of the dark. <laughs> and my naughty little brother used to wait till I was in the very bottom of the basement and the light switch was up by the stairs. And he turned the lights off and slammed the door. And I would come screaming through the dark basement, help me. And it, it, I, my family still laughs about this. But in the darkness of Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, the darkness is something much scarier than the darkness of the basement. It's the darkness of the dominion of human nature. L let me explain this. Darkness, in verse 13, refers to the rule of unconverted human nature. In other words, you and I inherited this evil human nature that hates God. We got that from Adam and Eve. It's called original sin. When you let your sinful nature rule your life, that is scary. One of the scariest Twilight Zone episodes, remember this one? This evil man dies. And he wakes up, and standing before him is a man dressed in white. Welcome. Everything you want here is yours. And the man says, really? Well, I'd like a drink. So he takes him to the bar, and the guy drinks a lot. Oh, now I'd like some women. So he takes him, he gets him some women. And the whole half an hour, the guy's getting sicker and sicker and sicker of getting everything that he wants. And, and the man says to the man dressed in white, you know, I really think you made a mistake. I was a pretty bad guy. I should be in the other place. And the guy in white smiles and says, you are in the other place. <laughs> Woo! -hoo! To be chained to your fallen human nature for eternity is hell. It's a scary thing. You want to be rescued from it. He, Jesus, has rescued us from the darkness, and next word, and transferred us, I'm going to say reassigned us, to the kingdom of his beloved son. And that's the good thing. He doesn't just rescue us from darkness. He then transfers us and reassigns us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So the, se the first thing God says to you is, you are rescued. The second thing he says is, you are reassigned. God says, you are reassigned, uh, transferred. I'll tell you what I thought of. <laughs> when I was a young preacher, my first church was down in Florida. I worked under a senior pastor. He's now dead. Uh, he was an alcoholic. He lied a lot. Turns out he's embezzled lots of money out of that church they discovered years later. I worked f under him for a year and a half. It was a miserable time. But then, hallelujah, I got reassigned. I got a new church up here in Minneapolis. And I left him in that church in Florida, and I worked with three of the most marvelous Christian pastors you could. I, I felt like I died in God in heaven. <laughs> I got reassigned. 
And not, God doesn't just rescue from the devil. He then reassigns you to the kingdom of his beloved son. The next thing, the last thing your father says about you is in verse 14. In Christ we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. So God, number one, says you are rescued. Number two, he says, I now reassign you to my son. And number three things he says is you are redeemed. Now, what does the word redeemed mean? Paul wrote this letter about 60 A.D., it would have been read out loud in church. Some of the people hearing this in Colossae would have been slaves of the Roman Empire. And a slave longed for the day he would be redeemed. And their ears would have pricked up when Paul said, we are now redeemed through Christ. Let me define the word. The word redeem means to pay a price to set a slave free. So the slave was waiting for somebody to come and pay the price to the master so he could become a freed citizen. That is what Jesus did for us. He's our redeemer. He paid our sin price for us. So let me press the analogy. Who were the slaves? We were. Who was the old slave master who owned us? Satan. Who paid our price? Jesus did. What is the price that Jesus paid? It says he paid his blood. That means his death on the cross. Now here's the hard question. Who, when Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, who did he pay that to? Well, some people think he paid it to the devil. No, he didn't. <laughs> Read Romans chapters 1 and 2. Our problem was the wrath of God, the holiness of God. And for God, who is a holy God, to be satisfied Somebody has to pay for our sins. Jesus paid our sin price to God. It's kind of like this. I think his name was Homer Larson. For World War I, a ticking bomb lands in a foxhole. Homer Larson threw himself on the bomb. It killed him, but it saved the rest of the men in his foxhole, and he got the Medal of Honor for that. The ticking bomb is the wrath of God against our sin. One day that thing is going to go off. It's called Judgment Day. Jesus throws himself. He goes to the cross. He takes himself upon himself, the punishment for our sin, so that all who believe in him have the forgiveness of sins and go to heaven. Have you done that? Have you come to Christ and say, yes, I am a sinner. I do deserve hell. Jesus, I trust you died for my sins. You need to do that if you never have. So let's review. Here's who your heavenly father says you are. Number one, you're rescued from the dominion of your old hu human nature. You know, we still sin as Christians, but we're not ruled by it anymore. You're rescued. Second thing, you're reassigned. You don't belong to the devil anymore. You belong to the kingdom of his beloved son. And then the third thing your father says, I have redeemed you. All your sins have been paid for. You are forgiven through Christ. You're my child. Now let me share one last thing that's kind of strange. <laughs> the old senior pastor in Florida that I used to work under, after I moved to Minneapolis, he would call me now and then. I'm not making this up. He thought we had a good relationship. <laughs> Hello? And he wanted me to come back down and work with him in Florida again. Ah! And, I, and he would call and talk to me. And when he would talk, I'd still kind of... But then I have to remind myself, I'm not under his authority anymore. I've got a new boss. And listen, Satan will bring, Satan does not give up on you. Even though you're redeemed and you belong to Christ, he'll still try to lie to you and tell you, look, you belong to me. And when he does that, we've got to stand and believe we are who our Father says we are. Redeemed, reassigned, <laughs> and rescued. Believe that, and it will transform your life. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study, where we ask Pastor Brock questions regarding the Bible. Pastor Brock, our first question today is, did Jesus save us from God the Father's wrath? I don't think that's the way to say it. 
Jesus saved us from his own wrath and the Father's wrath and the Holy Spirit. There's one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three, the one true God, was angry at our sin. So Jesus came to earth to die on the cross to save us from the Father's wrath and his own wrath toward our sin and the Holy Spirit's wrath toward our sin. So, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're in need of salvation from the wrath of God. That's what God himself provided. We didn't do that. God gave us his son. God provided the atonement for our sins. Now, I gotta say this, Lamona. One of our viewers sent me this. He goes to one of the largest evangelical Lutheran church in America congregations. The ELCA is very liberal now. This pastor is very liberal. And listen to the devotional, if you want to call it that, that he sent out. Talking about, this is called the substitutionary atonement of Christ. That we are sinners that deserve to die on the cross. Jesus substitutes himself, takes our punishment so we could be forgiven. Well, this pastor thinks that's nonsense. Listen to his devotional. Substitutionary atonement, it's a cold, calculating logic that portrays God ultimately as victim to God's own rules, incapable of genuine forgiveness or love until punishment has been ladled out and blood has been shed. That's not a picture of God that finally I can stomach. No, quite frankly, it is not biblical. Yes, it is. Uh, we're talking, after all, about the God who calls light from darkness and gives life to death, but who suddenly is incapable of genuine forgiveness. So let me offer another picture of why Jesus died. So he doesn't like the atonement of, of, of substitution. So here's what, here's what Jesus did on the cross. Because, why did Jesus suffer? Because that's what happens in the world. Each and every day people suffer torment, sometimes physical, sometimes emotional, sometimes spiritual. And so God comes in love in order to live not only with us, but also as one of us, taking on our lot and our life and our experience, all that we experience, so as to understand us and help us stand, and he stands with us completely and fully. Huh? Huh? <laughs> no. Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is the core of the Christian faith, mm -hmm. that Christ died for our sins, that substitution, mm -hmm. and he rose from the dead. You can't deny those yeah. and be a Christian. This man is in a pulpit over the, mm -hmm. one of the largest ELCA Lutheran churches in the country. Sad. It is sad. There you go. You need to read your Bible. You need to know the and word. He, and he, yeah, and he will tell you that he does, but mm -hmm. okay. Some groups teach that a Christian can get to the point where he no longer sins. Is this possible? No. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, there's, there are some holiness groups. Some are Methodist, some are Pentecostal, mm -hmm. that teach you can go for years without sinning. Mm -hmm. And I, I took my kids to a Bible camp years ago, and it was, we rented part of a Methodist holiness camp, I think it was. And this, the camp director and I had quite the discussion because he hadn't sinned for years. I said, what? Mm -hmm. I feel like I go five minutes without sinning mm -hmm. and thought, well, indeed, I'm doing pretty good. But, and I quoted him, 1 John 1, 8, mm -hmm. if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I'll tell you a story. I think it was Spurgeon that was preaching one night, and during his sermon, a man stood up, amen, preach it, brother. I haven't sinned for 15 years. And Spurgeon ignored it, and, he, and he, again, uh, he kept preaching, and, no, amen, brother, I haven't sinned for... Finally, he does it a third time or so, and Spurgeon says to the man, is your wife here tonight? <laughs> well, no. Would you come and bring her tonight? I want to hear her say that you okay. haven't sinned for 15 years. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I will say this, though. There is a difference between sinning and repenting, which every Christian does, mm -hmm. but if you're living in impenitent sin, mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says you're not going to heaven. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mona, if you, if you sin and you repent, there's forgiveness. If you're living in impenitent mm -hmm. sin, 1, John chap excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11 says you're not going to heaven. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, when somebody's living with their boyfriend and they think, well, I'm a Christian. No, you're not. Not according to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. And don't we sin sometimes without even knowing it? We sure do, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm a Christian, but I was told lies about myself growing up. I have trouble believing I am a new creature in Christ. What do I do? You know, that happened to me growing up. I think it happens to lots of people. You're, somehow there's been a lie planted in you. Mm -hmm. And for me, if you go to my website, it was the whole same-sex attraction thing. And that's a lie that I fight. Mm -hmm. I'm, that's not who I am. But you've got to fight it. 
Because uh, the devil wants us to believe that we are who he says he, we, mm -hmm. we are instead of believing what God, who God says we are. So I would say to this person, I mean, um, Mona, the Star Tribune newspaper here in Minneapolis, it's not liberal, it's radical. Mm -hmm. Here's a big article about a f father who discovers his child is transgender, and so they're going to give the child hormone blockers. And, and here's the little boy who thinks he's a girl, and dad says, okay, then you're a little girl. Mm -hmm. not, there's not a hint. In the, there's no objective journalism here. There's not a hint that there's another side. Mm -hmm. but and, and good luck finding the other side in, on ABC Evening News. But if you go to the Internet and type in, I regret my gender transition, mm -hmm. or I reject my sex change. You will see stories of people who said, yeah, I, I, I'm a man, I, I'm a uh, man who got castrated because I thought I was a woman, and worst thing I've done in my life. Mm -hmm. We've got school districts, we've got pastors. The ELCA Lutherans have the world's first transgender pastor. We've got churches, school districts, fathers that are telling their kids lies and and i i just feel horrible about what's happened to our culture listen if you're a man you know some people think there's 127 genders mm -hmm. no there isn't read romans excuse me uh, matthew 18. jesus said he who made them in the beginning made them male and female he doesn't add or transgender or bisexual or homosexual or omnisexual or so what you need to do if you've been told a lie you stand on the truth of scripture yeah. You, if, uh, you battle it with, with being in a good church, by getting prayer, by going to Holy Communion, and you fight the devil's lies by those tools. And continue to speak the truth in love. To yourself even. Yeah. yeah. All right. If Jesus is God, who was he praying to in the Garden of Gethsemane? Gethsemane? Yeah. Himself? Yeah. I think I got that from somebody who mm -hmm. doesn't believe in the Trinity. And uh, he didn't believe Jesus is God. And so here's my response. Christians believe, the Bible teaches, Jesus' last words on earth mm -hmm. were, go ye therefore, baptizing them in the name singular mm -hmm. of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So there's one singular God, but in God are three persons. And there's distinctions. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. There's, even though they're one, mm -hmm. there's still distinction. God the Father didn't die on the cross. God the Son died mm -hmm. on the cross. So who was Jesus praying to in the garden? Was he praying to himself? Well, no, you have God the Son, praying to God the Father. I know this is confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, as somebody said once, he who doubts the Trinity will lose his salvation. Mm -hmm. He who tries to understand the Trinity will lose his mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, it's true, I don't understand it all, but that's, that's the answer. Okay. Yeah. If a person has had an abortion and is having trouble believing God forgives her, what would you recommend? Mm -hmm. I remember at the church I served a woman coming up afterwards and we got on her knees and she said, Pastor Brock, I had an abortion years ago and, and she just was having a hard time believing God could forgive her. Mm -hmm. And so she confessed her sin. And John chapter 20 says, if you can forgive the sin, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. So I put my hand on her head and I said, I announce to you, you are forgiven of all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if you can't get the belief that your sins are forgiven, mm -hmm. you might need to do that. Go to a Christian friend, confess your sin. Go to a pastor or a priest, confess your sin. But um, God forgives the sins of abortion mm -hmm. and, and, or any sin we commit. And you can just ask God directly, God forgive me, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God forgives us. But if you can't seem to believe it, mm -hmm. talk to another Christian about it. Is there any sin too big that God won't forgive? The, the only unforgivable sin is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit and you're rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, which is unbelief, that'll, that'll damn you. But every, Jesus said, whatever sins men commit, they will be forgiven, except for that one. For that one. <laughs> All right. Yeah. A viewer comment. You said on a prior program that we should forgive ourselves, but nowhere does the Bible tell us to forgive ourselves. We do not have that authority. Your response? Yeah, I did not agree with this with this person. And again, I'll, I'll go back to John chapter 20. Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes you have to forgive yourself. I mean, what does God want this woman who had an abortion to do? Kick herself for the rest of her life? I think what you do is you get forgiveness, you ask God's forgiveness, you forgive yourself, and you move on. Mm -hmm. True. Um, can Satan read our thoughts and our minds? 
First thing I learned when I was 12 in confirmation class are the three omnis of God. God is omnipresent, that means he exists everywhere. God is omnipotent, omnipotent, that means he's all powerful. And he's omniscient, which means mind. God is all knowing. Satan is not omnipresent, mm -hmm. he's not omnipotent, and he's not all knowing. Only God is. So can Satan read your mind? I don't know that he can. Mm -hmm. He can plant thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, it says in, in John that Satan put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot mm -hmm. to betray the Christ. And when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, in John, in uh, what is it, Luke chapter three, uh, Satan put it into Jesus' head, jump off the building, turn the rocks to bread, um, uh, fall down and worship me, Jesus didn't. So he can plant thoughts, mm -hmm. but can he read all our thoughts? I don't know that he can, he's not omniscient. What does a Christian do when they feel like Satan's attacking them physically or spiritually? Or? Uh, I think what I do, uh, I pray and I plead the blood of Christ, which means Christ died on the cross. He shed his blood for my sins. So now I belong to God, not you, devil. Mm -hmm. That's one thing you do. I love to him. I love to worship. I love to sing hymns if I'm being attacked. Mm -hmm. So just uh, redeemed how I love to proclaim and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Just a good hymn to get your mind off of the devil and onto God. Praise God until the devil runs. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> if I am redeemed and set free from sin, why do I still sin? Does this mean I am not really saved? Every Christian sins after conversion. Again, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Well, we have to be committing some sins to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is forgiveness of sins, and if you sin after conversion, you're still saved. But repent, claim 1 John 1, 9, and repent. Again, living in impenitent sin, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 says, you're in trouble if you don't repent. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who says, that they were born a woman, but they really are a man. Yeah, this is the lie of our culture right now, that mm -hmm. if you think you're a woman, you're a woman. And it, I, this is absolute craziness. And these lies, Satan is loving what's going on in the media, promoting all this in our schools, some of them. Mm -hmm. So I would just say, no, you stand on who God's, if you're born a man, even if you feel like you're a woman, you're a man. Mm -hmm. and, and, and don't listen to the devil's lies, which are everywhere today. If a person wants help, yeah. Where can they go? Just, yeah, I would, I would go to a good church. Not a church like the ELCA Lutherans, which has the world's first transgender bishop. Mm -hmm. You don't go to that denomination. But you go to a good Bible preaching church. You say, Pastor, can I talk to you about something? Or good, go to a good Christian counselor and get some help. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're almost out of time. Mm -hmm. If you want to watch any of our uh, previous shows, you can go to pastorstudy.org. That's two S's, pastorstudy.org. Um, Pastor Brock, and any? We got 14 seconds. Thank you, Mona, for the wonderful job you do. Everybody in our ministry, except for me, is a volunteer. I get a modest salary, and the rest of us do this because we love the Lord. So pray for us, support us, and see you next time. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the good news of Jesus Christ because of the generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.